Hello, Trabant. Hello, Tito. What have we got over here today? Mm. Look at me. Positive for Howard Marks. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Duman. It was take place today, April 22nd, at 0800 hours and four minutes. No. Are we going to watch a movie today? <laughs> I wish we could. It's uh, my, one of my favorite movies, Minority Report, starring with uh, Tom Cruise, which was supposed to be a sequel of Total Recall in 1992, but for some financial reasons, they postponed making the movies for 10 years. And this is uh, like a deja vu what's happening right now in China and with let's, let's, let's take a look what do we have here uh, this is from the BBC this looks like an interview in China right 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 the BBC was allowed for some reason to enter one yes. of the so-called vocational camps in Xinjiang so vocational camps where, where people, kind of like vocational schools, where people learn a trade, you know, they get some education. Yeah. All right, right. Okay, well, uh, let's see what the director is saying. Can determine okay. their guilt in advance. Okay. Wow! Well, this is exactly like the plot of Minority Report. Of course not. You can't wait until they commit a crime. <laughs> what the yeah, Jiang Jiushen, the foreign affair person for Xinjiang, apparently a fan of Minority Report. It seems like it, but hang on. Isn't he, uh, you know, in, in charge of a vocational center why is he talking about crimes here Ooh, well he talks about crimes that hasn't been that haven't been committed yet and so the, the school is supposed to present some crime yeah wow yeah, like in my report apparently they have some visions they can foresee the crimes happening uh, in the future and they prevent the crimes from happening by arresting the people before they commit the crimes. See how like advanced people. China is. Wow. wow. Just Amazing. wow. Yeah. yeah. China is just ahead of time apparently. When I saw this report, it struck me like the movie. I mean, I thought, what kind of a dystopia are we talking about here? Well, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, today we will be talking about uh, uh, an area in the very western part of China, which is called Xinjiang. Well, Why is it called uh, Xinjiang? Uh, let's have a look. Um, it's a good yeah. question. Um, I will pop up a map of China here. What you can notice here is that this is a, a map of uh, the Qing Dynasty, which ruled mm -hmm. the uh, um, uh, Manchu Dynasty, or non-Chinese Dynasty, which ruled China from uh, 1644, I think, until uh, 1911, when it collapsed uh, in the Xinhai Rebellion. And right, yes. uh, we see that uh, this area has already <clears throat> uh, been incorporated into uh, the Xinjiang province. So Xinjiang literally means a new border. It has actually been uh, controlled by uh, some dynasties uh, during China's history at one point or another. But uh, this is where we get uh, uh, 
modern day Xinjiang. In uh, 1759, the Qing dynasty captured it from the Dungar uh, Khanat uh, and uh, the population, the Orad Mongols, were essentially massacred. So we already started with a kind of a bloody history. And uh, mm -hmm. afterwards, keep in mind that uh, this area is, uh, you know, has a lot of yep. deserts. Um, it was not quite as attractive for a lot of the uh, Han Chinese settlers. So at this point, we uh, start to see uh, more uh, Uyghurs coming in, who are the uh, currently the, uh, the <laughs> let's say the uh, largest minority. <laughs> Yeah, after the who, are, who are kind Dungar. of becoming becoming the the uh, uh, let's say the largest minority in uh, Xinjiang. Yeah, after the massacre of Jungars, the Qianglong Emperor granted the the Uyghurs or somebody called them Uyghurs to resettle in the whole territory of today's Xinjiang. I mean, what's a have a look at what we can see here you know we see a kind of a formation from the 9th century until the the present day of people who mm -hmm. would speak a uh, turkic language so very different mm -hmm. from uh, the Han Chinese um, who might uh, also look uh, different from the Han Chinese and you know who would be uh, Muslim so mm -hmm. again uh, different from the Han Chinese but mm -hmm. uh, the area has uh, uh, been administered to, to a large extent by uh, people who were from outside the province. After mm -hmm. the uh, collapse of the Qing dynasty, um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, last Qing governor, uh, Yan Dahua, fled. He basically ran away, and uh, one of his subordinates, uh, Yang Zhengxin, took control of the province. So this is the area that uh, he came to control, uh, because he would uh, support then uh, President Yuan Shikai, who wanted to become a new emperor of China, but failed. And uh, during this time, China was uh, disintegrated into a, a lot of uh, warlords who would... Uh, basically fight against each other and uh, we do see uh, you know the, the government uh, the Guomindang government um, <laughs> kind of pushed that down here to the south uh, mm -hmm. because here was the uh, Guangdong military academy and uh, the government did try to assert its influence you know they would uh, march up north and they would uh, uh, send uh, <clears throat> or one of their people, uh, Fan Yaonan, to sort of assist Yang Zhenxin and maybe replace him, and you know, which he eventually did. You know, he kind of got tired of waiting, <laughs> and in 1926, uh, mm -hmm. he would, uh, oh, sorry, 1928, he would uh, uh, shoot uh, uh, Yang, um, Yang Zhenxin at a banquet. <laughs> but mm. he didn't live to uh, see his uh, career come to fruition because he will be removed by uh, uh, one of Yang's uh, officers, uh, by the man uh, uh, who we can see here, Qi Shuren. Um, in contrast to, uh, in, I guess in contrast to uh, <clears throat> Yang Zhenxin, who was kind of trying to balance the different ethnicities in the area, because we also see Kazakhs uh, living here, maybe also some uh, Mongols uh, at this point. Uh, and I guess also in contrast to the uh, more progressive uh, uh, Fan Yaonan, uh, Jin Shuren would basically try to sinicize the area. He would appoint Han Chinese to any positions of power. And because uh, this is how he would rule from uh, 1928, as uh, early as 1930s, we see uh, uh, rebellions under, mm -hmm. against his rule. Uh, the most important would be the Kumul Rebellion. Uh, mm -hmm. Which uh, you know would involve Uyghurs, uh, other Turkey groups, and uh, the 
of Hui Chinese, basically the Muslim Chinese. Qin Shi Ren tried to uh, uh, recruit, uh, you know, some uh, white Russians in China to crush the revolt, but he was uh, unsuccessful. And uh, mm -hmm. eventually, he would be uh, replaced by uh, he would be replaced by uh, a governor who would. Uh, come to control Xinjiang for uh, the next decade or, or so, Sheng Shizai. But before we get to him, there is a very important happen that event that happened uh, in Kashgar uh, in 1933. On uh, the 12th of November, the uh, East Turkestan Republic was proclaimed. For they were debating whether to call it uh, East Turkestan or Uyghuristan. But uh, eventually they settled on the name East Turkestan. So this came to be known as the uh, first East Turkestan Republic. Because there would be another, was an, another one. We will, oh, we will talk about that. It was very short. It only existed, uh, like I said, from November 1933 until around April 1934 when uh, the Chinese Muslim... Uh, uh, Guomindang 36th Division of the National Revolutionary wow. Army under Ma Zongying. I, am, I imagine they came somewhere from uh, from this area, which is inhabited by, uh, in part by the uh, Chinese Muslims, the Hui Chinese, who are also Muslims, but they have uh, they are closer to Han Chinese than the Uyghurs. Right. Uh, so again, not even though they are Muslim, there there are might be some t uh, ethnic tensions there. Um, mm -hmm. And so they would uh, <clears throat> uh, basically conquer uh, the area and then defeat the First East Turkestan Republic in uh, around April 1934. And in the um, Battle of Kashgar, the Republic has come to an end after uh, they executed uh, its uh, two emirs, Abdul Abugra and uh, Nur Ahmad Jambugra. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Guomindang administration didn't last too long because, like I said, uh, the Soviet Union invaded. Uh, oh, before we do that, here we can see the uh, first uh, uh, flag of uh, East Turkestan. So, mm -hmm. the reason why I'm mentioning is, is this is because uh, the, short, the state, although short-lived, would often be referenced as an example of the first Uyghur state and is still mm -hmm. referenced now by uh, Uyghur nationalists and separatists who want to separate from China and point mm -hmm. uh, to this as an example. Uh, mm -hmm. Here we can see Sheng Shizai who would uh, rule with uh, the help of, <laughs> so of, uh, st of uh, Stalin essentially. Yeah. yeah. And uh, would control the area until 1941, until the uh, uh, Operation Barbarossa commenced and uh, <clears throat> Nazi Germany would invade the Soviet Union. So I guess he was thinking, oh, well, crap, you know, uh, Stalin is not going to send me any help if I have uh, some uprising against me. So he sort of tries to, uh, you know, um, uh, get into the uh, good graces of the Guomindang, the Chinese nationalist government. But uh -huh. uh, they don't trust him anymore. Chiang Kai shek doesn't trust him that much. And, you know, Stalin stops trusting him as well. So eventually, uh, the nationalist government kind of acknowledges him. Uh, but, uh, you know, by 1944, they uh, kind of tried to send him away. They demote him to some uh, other functions. They sent in their uh, uh, own administrators. And again, we see this like a competition between uh, China on one side and the Soviet Union on uh, uh, the other, and Xinjiang unfortunately being stuck in the middle of this. Uh, uh -huh. The Soviets uh, created uh, their own Soviet state, but remember uh, we talked about the, the um, East Turkestan Republic. They created it sort of a second iteration. Uh, so, uh, in the northern part, uh, <clears throat> we see a Soviet state that came to reference uh, um, East Turkestan, and this would be the second East Turkestan Republic from uh, 1944 and uh, until 1949. 
So this was uh, again there was a rebellion ag uh, against the, the uh, Guomindang administrators that were not popular and uh, because of this Ili rebellion Soviet Union would come to control this area. Uh, the rest mm. I, I would imagine would still sort of be under Guomindang supervision uh, mm -hmm. but uh, in uh, 1949 the Communist People's Liberation Army the PLA were knocking uh, at their door so the Guomindang government Taoj uh, Sorry, the Guomindang uh, commander Tao Zhuyue and the government chair, uh, chairman uh, Buran Shahidi surrendered to them. Uh, but what about the uh, Second Eastern Eastern Republic? Well, right. the, uh, these uh, uh, five of uh, its leaders that uh, were trying to negotiate uh, with the Chinese government about some kind of a sovereignty died <laughs> in an air crash in uh, 1949 in uh, then the Kazakh uh, Soviet Socialist Repo Republic. Was bad so, luck. Uh, yeah, so uh, the entire uh, area would begin to uh, be integrated into the province of Xinjiang uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. In, uh, and would follow the, um, you know, the events that occurred in uh, China after 1949, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and the like. In 1959, uh, sorry, 1955, uh, I guess in an effort, you know, to recognize that this area was uh, mostly settled by Uyghurs, uh, it was renamed uh, the uh, <coughs> Xinjiang Uyghur uh, Autonomous Area. Uh -huh. And, uh, w uh, however, um, as the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, entered Xinjiang, uh, the Chinese government would still follow the kind of uh, policies that uh, a reference uh, or that have their roots in Imperial China. Uh, that means uh, Han Chinese uh, would come in, mostly soldiers, but also their families. And the soldiers wouldn't just serve in the army, but it would also be in control of some uh, industries. Um, uh, this is what has come to be known uh, as the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, or uh, Xinjiang Shenshan, uh, Shengchan, Tianshe Bintuar, uh, the uh, usually referenced by the elastic characters, Bintuan, a corps, literally a, a group of soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, during uh, 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 Imperial China, a lot of dynasties would follow a kind of a slow policy of expansion and protection of uh, its border areas where they would send soldiers to uh, these remote borderlands and uh, in return the soldiers would be given some land where the, they could have their farms but of course if uh, uh, necessary you know they would have to fight right now, it's like a Roman Republic. Um, I go there. All the Roman soldiers were promised after several years of service in the legions that the land, <laughs> the old style of rewarding the soldiers. Sorry, sorry. Yes. I just, no, this yeah, is this on. is the the funny thing is you know that this has uh, still been retained to uh, a certain extent, yeah. and. Um, this is one of the, uh, the reason why I mentioned this is this is uh, one of the reasons why uh, more Han Chinese people would start entering this area. And I imagine, you know, this was the uh, uh, government idea all along, you know, to have the area. First of all, it's a, it's a, it's a border, it has to be protected, uh, and, uh, you know, why not have uh, people mix there a little bit? You don't want some ethnicity that, uh, you know, uh, would have separatist intentions <laughs> on your border. This is what is, uh, you know, been uh, <laughs> troubling China even now when you look at yes. uh, Tibet and Xinjiang. Yeah, it was nothing new. I mean, uh, Stalin was doing the same thing in the yeah, right yeah. Uh, where he came also to true. power, shuffling the nations around the country and and. Uh, Russifying the different regions by sending the Russian settlers. 
this this was the same thing. I mean, Chinese government sponsored a mass migration of Han Chinese to Xinjiang, right? Same, same. Yeah. yeah. Now keep in mind, you know, in the 1980s, after Deng Xiaoping's policy of Gaige Kaifang uh, reforms and opening up, um, yeah. more Chinese, more people would come to the larger cities uh, like uh, Urumqi and uh, Karama mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. um, but keep in mind, you know, uh, a lot of uh, Xinjiang is still rural, especially in the uh, southern part, which still has a predominantly Uyghur population. Um, so a lot of these people would want to work in the cities, but now you see uh, there are Han Chinese uh, in the cities too, and more of them keep coming. So this is an area, uh, you know, when you start to add uh, economic inequality into the mix, <laughs> it starts to look a little bit like uh, maybe not a Balkan powder keg, but let's say mm. <laughs> a Central Asian powder keg, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a silly analogy, uh, maybe inaccurate, but uh, what we see here from the 1990s, we see a lot of tensions that would uh, boil over to... Uh, um, Incidents, even terrorist incidents, bombings uh, mm. uh, by Uyghurs, or either in Xinjiang or in other parts of China, in for example in Beijing uh, or in uh, Kunming, uh, and the government uh, would always respond by cracking down on Xinjiang. Right, right, right. We can reference, yeah. for example, from the 1990s, we can talk about the uh, uh, bus bombings in 1997 or the infamous incident in uh, Karamai in 1994 where uh, you know a lot of school children <laughs> would uh, 288 school children would burn to their deaths in a theater because some uh, idiot uh, gave them the instruction okay wait let the leaders go first uh, yeah it was a very good move so otherwise they could die oh yeah yeah what, what a tragedy you know yeah. This this was yeah, a, the, a huge incident, and you know a lot of people will be pro, uh, prosecuted for this, and has since kind of become uh, uh, you know a satire on the the cronyism and the nepotism that uh, exists uh, in Chinese society and in the Communist Party too. Yeah, for Chinese society, Communist Party, I would say typical. Yeah, typical. Un unfortunately, it is, and. Uh, yeah, as mm -hmm. we as we get uh, um, you know um, closer towards uh, um, 2000s and uh, 2010s, uh, we see m even more and more of these incidents, and it seems like the the government, uh, the Chinese government, doesn't know what to do. They keep having crackdowns, but uh, you know, uh, people are still uh, revolting. You know, I don't, it's a maybe maybe it didn't occur to them, you know, that one could be a function of the other. But uh, okay, so basically, the the Uyghurs were rebellious people through the through from the beginning since they were conquered by the Qing Dynasty. So we are talking about uh, three hundred years of uh, rebellion after rebellion, uh, which was uh, sometimes supported by the Soviet Union until the seventies. The, the Soviets uh, mandled in the in their in Chinese internal affairs by establishing uh, like uh, independent new communist parties in in Xinjiang, which is unbelievable. Seven <laughs> yeah, Keep in mind, this was uh, you know at that time this was a a, boor, uh, a border area between the Soviet Union and uh, China. Right, right, right. So, and we now we are in twenty uh, first century. We are talking about uh, two thousand nine, right after the Summer Olympics in Beijing. There were just uh, basically every year like a terrorist attacks. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, at the the, rec the more recent history, right here we see, yeah. for example, a timeline. Yeah from uh, 2013 
and uh, okay. this this timeline is kind of a sig is kind of significant because uh -huh. uh, I guess you know sort of uh, thinking well other countries have a a war on terror maybe we can declare our own people's war on terror and we see uh -huh. this is uh, happening at around the time that Xi Jinping uh, or after uh, Xi Jinping would uh, become the new general secretary of the Communist Party. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I remember uh, particularly one, it was 2014, uh, no, 2014 at the Kunming, is it, train station, when uh, there was a knife, knife attack on the passengers in, at the Kunming rail station, railway station, and the, the attackers killed like 31 people and wounded like 143 other people. Like that was like uh, like everybody in China was talking about this attack. Like uh, it was very scary. Yeah, and uh, and people were very scared yeah. because it happened outside of Xinjiang. Yes, this is this is uh, another reason. But then the, the, there was <clears throat> the incident which uh, occurred in Beijing. Oh yes, there was the car suicide attack that happened on Tiananmen Square. That one. Yeah. All right. That's, 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 that's the one I mean. This this was I guess the, the the thing that scared people the most. Yeah, not many people were killed. Only two people, two uh, two uh, bystanders. I think one of them was Korean. Were killed. There was a big explosion, and you know the people inside the car died. Yes, but uh, it happened in Beijing. You have to keep that in mind. Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square. This so this this uh, you know this kind of scares the government. Yep, yep, yeah. That was that was wow. That was scary. So you know the government would respond with uh, crackdown, sending soldiers there. For example, here we can see uh, <laughs> soldiers under uh, in uh, Hotian in Hotan. In uh, okay. in uh, uh, the southern part of uh, Xinjiang, and here we see a, a statue uh, of Chairman Mao with uh, oh, Kurban Tulum, who was a, a, a local uh, farmer, electrician, and a communist functionary, a deputy uh, uh, for uh, Xinjiang in um, during huh. Mao during Mao's era. So he came to kind of uh, be uh, used as uh, uh, kind of a symbol of unity, you know, between the uh -huh. uh, Chinese people and the Uyghur people, and the uh, and the Uyghur farmers, apparently. <laughs> yes. yeah. right, so right. um, we can mention a few a few more things, but what I wanted to point out was, uh, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a correct analogy, but you know, we, we see some people when there were incidents like these using it to strengthen their own position. For example, the the Russian president Vladimir Putin, when there were uh, the terrorist uh, attacks in uh, the 1990s, you know, he would also uh, use these events to uh, kind of. Uh, Korea, uh, this might be seen Just as the beginning of trying to create yeah. a more autocratic government. Yeah, justification for all the hard measures yes. that they impose. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's. It, I don't know if the analogy is correct here, but it, it, it does come into mind, especially uh, uh, when you can see the appointment of uh, Comrade uh, Chen Chengguo as uh, oh, yeah. the party secretary in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, who was Chen Chengguo? Well, uh, mm -hmm. in his uh, previous post, he was the... Uh